Hello, this is Evan Rogerson, 9 Motor Gang here, and today we're going to go ahead and break down the 2.2 version game manual update that just dropped earlier today. A uh, couple things did change that were pretty important, but for the most part, it's mostly minor, small fixes. So, you guys know the drill. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe in order to please the YouTube algorithm, and let's get right into it. So, the first thing we have is some new definitions here. So, they defined goalkeeping, defensive, and offensive. So these are basically like the strategies, because like the offensive robot gets the benefit of the doubt, was never really defining what offensive was, but it's exactly what you would expect it to be. So offensive is a robot that is going ahead and trying to score points. So like they're putting blocks in a goal, they're moving towards a goal, um, basically just anything that's trying to score points. And then defensive is anything that is trying to either stop the opponents from scoring points or getting rid of their points. So it should be things like de-scoring, um, but then like blocking, um, trapping, and then goalkeeping, which is our other new definition. So this is basically when you have a stick going in through the top of the goal. And that's more defined in SG10, which got pretty much a complete rewrite. It's like five times its size now. So we'll kind of break down that in a little bit. But now there are strict definitions, which I think is good, just because it makes it more clear, especially for newer referees, what is actually offensive and what is defensive. Because if you're smashing into somebody, some referees might think that that's offensive, but it's, it's actually defensive play. And as per usual, we will have the newer version, this is 2.2 on the left-hand side, and we will have 2.1, which is the older version, on the right-hand side. So, the next rule that they've changed here is they also kind of went through and, like, got rid of some of the stuff from GG9 about hooking your robot onto the field. These aren't necessarily as strict, you just need, because it doesn't really matter if it's, like, affecting blocks within the goal, it's now just, like, if you're in the top, you are potentially at risk for this. Just don't become entangled with the goal. They also updated the Code of Conduct Violation rule flowchart. So you can see here they added basically two things that changed. So if the report is about the event partner that your code of conduct reporting, don't bring it to the event partner's attention. Just bring it directly to your RSM, which makes sense. Um, I heard some stuff from a competition that was happening from somebody, and that makes sense that they've changed this as a result of what happened there. And then also they changed some stuff down here to say, like, if you are getting talked to by the event partner about, like, code of conduct with either the head referee or judge advisor, you should not be told about the, how this will affect your standing in judged awards. Although 99% of the time, if you're getting like fully, re if you get this far down on the chart, um, then probably you are going to be disqualified from judged awards. Yeah, you have to have already talked to the coach at this point, contacted the RSM. If you're get if it's getting this far down, you're probably not going to win any judged awards, anyways. Um, and then they also changed it so that some of the wording here, so it's not just alliance selection. Um, and finals because technically that doesn't apply to vex you next up this is in relation to rule g num g4 so this is the like don't whole count and have other teams build your robots for you rule so they basically just added this part of the red box just to say that it shouldn't be like a witch hunt to go and find teams that have violations but when they do come up you should still deal with them like you shouldn't be actively going around quizzing people on all their stuff but like if the judges are just doing their interview stuff and they notice that teams can't answer build related questions maybe they're doing second interviews for the build award or something then yes that is when it becomes you should be using the tools to look for potential violations and then additionally they added this other part that like if you're intentionally trying to like weaponize g4 reports which is, like reporting robots that aren't actually in violation of the rule um then that is a, also a code of conduct violation in and of itself so don't like misuse the form thing to try and like report people for having Robot, similar robots that aren't G4 territory, because that could then backfire on you. Two changes to rule GG1 with the driver station. They changed it from just drive team members to the team's drive team members. So you cannot drive your alliance partner's robot for them anymore. I think there was already a Q&A that said that that wasn't legal, but now it's officially in the rule book now. And then they also kind of reworded the rule and turned like A, B, C, D into like Roman numerals right here, and then added point B. So, individuals who are not drive team members for a match cannot provide, like, directions, commands, or advice to drive team members during the match. Um, this was already kind of a thing, but they've kind of clarified it, made it a little bit more clear that this is like, hey, you can't be coaching from the sidelines, basically, and this is already in, like, either the event partner or head ref guidelines, like, you can't do that. And it could potentially be a violation, even if the team is doing just fine and they win the match. If you are coaching from the sidelines, then it could be considered a violation for you or the team. So, don't do that. Just cheer and try and get the energy award don't talk about match player strategy then they also clarified gg15 which was the offensive robots get the benefit of the doubt now that there are specific definitions for defensive and offensive 
So basically trying to like, the referee basically needs to pick which one, which was more defensive and less defensive or more offensive. So the referee basically pick one. So looking at those chart things, I mean, this shouldn't really change. It's just a little bit clearer for the referees. I mean, it's usually pretty obvious who's playing defense and who's playing offense. We, at the term that I was the event partner for, like a couple of weeks ago, we had a lot of cases of teams playing defense with like their intakes exposed and then getting entangled with another team. And that always ended up with the team that was playing the defense getting DQ'd because, hey, you're the one who's ramming into people's intakes. Like if you're going to play defense, use like the back of your robot that doesn't have a bunch of rubber band drillers that can easily get caught on things. So just kind of clarifying that and nothing's really changed here, more just clarifying the wording. Then they did go ahead and update rule SG7. This was the blocks rolling across the line because like, again, at the tournament that I was at, I don't think anyone actually legitimately got an autonomous win point, but there were like five autonomous win points given out just because teams were accidentally rolling blocks across the line. So Q&A 2924, the one responsible for that, that has since been updated. And if you're curious, I would highly recommend just reading through this as it basically gives a detailed list of, hey, exactly what happens. So you can go through and check which of these five scenarios occurred and then go through and see exactly what will happen. This is obviously a really good decision because AWP shouldn't be based on what your opponents do. It should be based on what you do. So good changes there. They also did some updates to, I believe, SG9 in regards to putting blocks into the loaders. And they basically clarified like, hey, just the intent of the rule here is to not stuff the loaders. Because if the loaders have like legitimately six or seven blocks in them, it's very easy for a robot when they ram in for the blocks to come out the top. So they're trying to basically eliminate that. And honestly, like I tell my teams and I tell the people that match load on Jayhawk, like don't even put the sixth block in there. Like having five blocks in there is plenty of lead time for you to start match loading and then it much less likely decreases the chance that you're going to accidentally knock a block out of the top which does add up and could potentially get you a dq just for accidentally knocking a block out the top so basically just you can load fast just and you'll get the benefit of the doubt just don't like stuff the loaders with lots of blocks creating potential sg4 violations that's basically all that they're saying there then this is probably one of the biggest changes in the game manual is the SG-10 basically full rewrite. You can see that they kind of completely read it a bunch of the stuff here. This is all new and they added some diagrams and a lot of Q&As. So basically if you're goalkeeping, which is when you have a stick going in through the top of the goal or you're like reaching in and technically uh, this bottom V portion of the goal, everything that's like in green, if you're in that like volume between those, that would then be considered goalkeeping. So if the referee determines that you are goalkeeping uh, and it is the driver control period at the head-to-head -head of the match so again this does not apply to skills so you can still use d-score sticks and skills all you want and you can also use them autonomous all you want which can be relevant i mean you can put them in and slide your blocks down to control bonus and actually leave them there and block that's still a legitimate strategy i think you'll basically be warned by the referee if you're still in there and then it will escalate to an sg7 violation so it's not like you're just going to get sg7 or sg10 real quick it's going to be like the referee is going to be like hey you should probably take your thing out and then if you don't get it out then it will be a violation so, like, reaching inside to control the blocks is defensive, um, and you won't get the benefit of the doubt if something happens, like robots getting entangled or whatever, but it is still allowed. And obviously, if you get, like, entangled with the goal, that's going to be on you, um, so you just need to be careful about that. Okay, so I think this is a little bit clearer, and again, doesn't apply to autonomous or skills. A couple small changes, this is actually two changes, R8 and R28, um, where basically the things with the brain, like the magnetic screen cover, there's somebody in the Q&A asking like, hey, can I use the brain screen cover and like cut it out and use it as extra plastic that doesn't count towards my plastic limit, and can I use the magnets for magnet stuff? And basically they're saying like, no, you can only use the brain magnet parts, like the screen protector, on the brain, and you can't modify them. So you can't like, I don't know, cut up your brain protector... I don't know why you'd want to do that if it was still stuck on the brain, but whatever. And this is the GDC hates fun moment of the video in which the GDC banned speakers and audio devices that create sound. So GDC just hates fun. They do not want you blasting music during the middle of the match. Very sad, very sad. Another small change. The old rule used to just say like heating polycarbonate to aid in bending is acceptable. Now it is heating like any non-shattering plastic, which is all the legal plastics. So you can now just heat like ABS, peak pet all the other plastics are perfectly fine to heat with bending not just polycarbonate anymore 
And then this is the last change specifically for the Vex U game manual rules. Uh, the Vex, like, I guess, product team kind of goofed up and they didn't really talk to the GDC and accidentally banned all Vex Pro parts for a couple of days because Vex Pro product line is discontinued, but Vex Pro parts are still legal and a bunch of Vex U teams still had Vex Pro parts. Just to clarify, Vex Pro parts never were and are not legal for V5RC. This is only for Vex U, the college level. But now basically they changed it so that if it looks like a Vex Pro, Pro part, and it's like not too different than a Vex Pro part, then it's still legal to use. It's kind of like the same rule that VRC has with like screws, or like if you're using third-party screws, like nylon screws or whatever, and it's not introducing additional functionality and still serving the same role as a Vex part, this would now be a Vex Pro part, then it is legal. So like you could probably buy like 8-inch wheels off of Andy Mark as a replacement for like the Vex Pro 8-inch wheels that are no longer being sold if you for some reason wanted to use 8-inch Omni wheels on your robot. Nobody would ever want to use that though. And that's about wraps it up for this video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and tell me what your favorite part of the game manual change is. I will see you in the next one.